Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the usual disclaimer that I uh, work for Historic England, but the views are my own. Um, and also I'm another one of John's students, so uh, filling both. <laughs> both points there. Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tensions that can arise from the competing values and understandings of war memorials. So I'm sure you can imagine that they're really non-contested part <laughs> of our heritage, um, by examining them through the lens of the First World War Memorials Programme. So I'm going to start by introducing some of these conflicts and some of the ideas around war memorials and the First World War Memorials Programme itself, as I'm aware not everyone seems to um, know what that is. Then I'm going to look at two examples of conflicting values relating to war memorial conservation. Then I'm going to look at just one example of a new approach to protection of war memorials that's being taken through the programme. Um, and finally, draw some brief conclusions. So, war memorials. Um, I think it's fair to say that war memorialisation has emerged as one of the primary <coughs> phenomena of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Following a decline in the 1960s and 70s when war memorials weren't perhaps as prevalent um, and weren't perhaps as, as out there in the public sphere, they are becoming ever more present and disrespectful treatment is often the source of public outrage, making media headlines and often inciting talk calls for tough justice amongst its perpetrators. So you might remember um, the collective public outcry when Charlie Gilmore sung of Pink Floyd guitarist David Gilmore was caught swinging from the flags of the Cenotaph during the 2012 student riots. Considered equally headline worthy, however, are examples where an individual's right to commemorate who they choose is perceived to be compromised at the site of a memorial. So on the right, we have retired nurse Cynthia O'Neill, who had her pot plant and small placard placed in tribute to the horses that served in the war, removed from the Burgess Hill War Memorial, among great public outcry um, with the, the local community. However, as many war memorials reach their own centenaries, their ability to act as flexible objects of memory, responding to future conflicts and changing attitudes towards the war dead, can be at odds with another layer of value that increases as the memorials increase in age, that of war memorials as objects of heritage within their own right. So in this presentation, I'm going to use the example of the government's First World War Memorials programme to explore some of the tensions that arise from these um, conflicting values. So for anyone that isn't um, aware of the First World War Memorials programme, it forms part of the suite of centenary activities that were announced in 2014 by the then Prime Minister, <coughs> David Cameron. So this is one of the programmes that forms part of a £50 million investment in centenary planning. It's a partnership between Historic England, Civic Voice, Imperial War Museums and War Memorials Trust, and is centrally funded by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. It has the overarching aim that as many First World War memorials as possible are in good condition by the end of the centenary. It has many different projects within the whole programme, but central to this aim are um, one to, uh, sorry, a project to protect memorials by adding 2,500 war memorials to the National Heritage List for England throughout the course of the centenary, um, which I'm sure, as <laughs> many of you will be aware, has its, many, uh, its own problems that come alongside that. Um, and it also aims to conserve war memorials by distributing over £2 million in grant funding for their repair. The war memorials targeted within the programme are primarily those which were constructed in the period directly after the First World War, and consequently are the ones which now themselves close to the centenary of their construction. So, in order to fully understand uh, engagement with these memorials at any given time, I think it's useful to contextualise memorials not only within their socio-political context, um, but within three parallel timescales that can um, help that understanding. So first, you have the chronological moment in time that a memorial is conceptualised and constructed. So this timescale takes into account both the socio-political circumstances that result in the memorial itself, but also the development of the memorial tradition at the point of that construction. And this is demonstrated by O's P on the diagram. Second is the time that's passed from the conflict being commemorated, demonstrated by CT on the diagram. So this is the time that's passed between the events or the individuals that are being commemorated and the, the monument being put up. So this will affect the type of memory that is held in relation to the individuals and events being commemorated. So moving from autobiographical memories 
through to historical memories. And the third time scale relates to the biography of the memorial itself. So this is MT on the diagram. And so we can conceptualise engagement with a memorial at any given point in time as the intersection of these three time scales. So if we take a look at the First World War Memorials programme, um, so most of the memorials that are dealt with within the programme are those that were put up in the 1920s. So at this stage, um, the, the memorial tradition had already developed in response to, to the Boer War previous conflicts to include the common soldier. So most of the memorials that we're looking at within the programme are those kind of traditional First World War memorials with the lists of soldiers' names, which are obviously quite different from memorials which are primarily triumphal in nature. The fact that the memorials are constructed in the 1920s means that for a contemporary audience, they're seen as being imbued with a special meaning because they were created directly by the bereaved and those who had had an autobiographical memories of the events and individuals that they were commemorating. So memorials that are put up in this, this time period are considered quite differently from, for example, a First World War memorial that's put up in response to the centenary in 2014. But the time that's passed from their construction also means they've been affected by further events. So following the Second World War, the meaning of war memorials as monuments to the war to end all wars, um, which, in which lists of names are kind of open to interpretation as a warning against future conflicts, change significantly as they're inscribed with the names of the day from a second conflict. The addition of local casualties from subsequent conflicts, so things like the Falklands or Iraq, further changes the meaning of these monuments as they're encouraging um, an understanding that sees memorials as kind of a fluid object that can be adapted to meet the changing needs of the community that it seems to serve. Finally, if we look at the time scale of the memorial itself, by the time we get to 2014 to 18, the time of the First World War Memorials programme, many of the memorials are themselves coming close to their own centenary. So this gives an added layer of meaning as an object of, of heritage, um, reflective not just of those who've died, but reflective of the time of their construction. And Historic um, England's memorial programme is reflective of this changing value. So, Neil, to go back to your favourite document, in Conservation Principles, Policies and Guidance, um, there are four value types set out, evidential, historical, aesthetic and communal value. Um, and of these, probably the one of most relevance to the War Memorial Programme is that of communal value. Communal value is described within the document, and I quote, as deriving its meaning from the meanings of a place for the, for the people who relate to it, or for whom it figures in their collective experience or memory. And within this description, <coughs> particular attention is given to heritage objects with commemorative and symbolic values, which are described as reflecting the meanings of a place for those who draw part of their identity from it or have emotional links to it. The most obvious examples are war and other memorials raised by community efforts which consciously evoke past lives and events. And this, I think, is probably the most interesting bit. So in this description, it's not memorials as representations of those from that locality that have lost their lives that's of primary importance. It's the community effort that's responsible for their mm -hmm. construction, something which seemed to be particularly pertinent in those examples that were raised as a result of public um, subscription. So it's the object as a representation of people coming together in the past, not just as an object to remember those um, from that locality that have died. This prioritisation of memorials as symbols of community has manifested itself in a particular approach to their conservation and protection during the First World War centenary period, and in particular through this aim to lift 2,500 memorials. Whilst prior to the programme, many memorials were already on the National Heritage List to England, these were most exclusively listed because of their architectural and artistic significance, such as the Royal Artillery Memorial in London, the one on the left, which was designed by Charles Jagger and Lionel Pearson and was first listed in 1970. But many of the now almost 2,000 memorials that have been added to the list as part of the First World War Memorials Programme, such as this example from Bramerton in Norfolk, are not listed because of their artistic or sculptural value, they are listed, and I quote directly from the list, because they are eloquent witnesses to the tragic impact of world events on this local community. 
and the sacrifice that he'd made in the First World War. These different values of objects of memory representing those that have died, or as objects of heritage representing communities responsible for their construction, can however lead to tensions and conflicts regarding the most appropriate treatment of a war memorial, particularly when its listed status affects the way that it can be treated and engaged with by that local community in the present. It was partly because of what was viewed as inappropriate treatment of memorials at the programme itself that came about. So um, things like this were drawn upon when, when, um, during the programme. So this in, on the example on the left is a memorial from my local village in Watco Drove. Um, and you can just about make out that um, a member of the community has scrubbed just the panel that has the name of their loved one on it. Um, which for, for that individual is seen as a, you know, an act of respect. They are making sure that the name um, of their loved one is visible and is represented. Um, but it is, it's, it's not um, uh, kind of conclusive to the whole, um, whole memorial. Um, and the example on the right, if you can just make out this one, it's a memorial from Redditch. And this one has had metal plaques screwed directly into um, the war memorial um, over the stone surface. So in such cases, it's the, the legibility of the names and the inclusion of all those from the community that have lost their lives through conflict that seem to have precedence over preserving a memorial in its original state as an eloquent witness to the events of 1914 to 18. So this can result in communities wanting their memorials to be as legible and pristine as possible, stripping away all surface dirt and recutting the names to make them more legible, adding names of those perceived to be missing, or fixing new plaques directly onto the existing structure. However, this practice is directly at odds often with conservation practice, which takes a very different view of how we should be treating an object that's almost 100 years old. So I'm just going to look at a couple of examples um, where the listing has come into tension um, with the, the views of the local community. So one such example of this is Shirley's Memorial, in the, um, so the village of Shirley in Warwickshire. So Shirley's Memorial, you can see uh, on its original state on the left, was erected following the First World War within the curtilage of St James's Church. And it was rededicated in 1953 with the addition of two panels with the names of Second World War casualties, which you can see the curved panels behind. After standing for almost a century, the memorial was beginning to appear a bit weathered and the name was becoming less legible. So as a result of this, one local resident took it upon himself to restore the memorial um, by painting the structure with white paint um, and in places picking out the inscription in black. You can just about see in the, the things in white. So he's gone around it with a bit of whitewash and then gone over the inscriptions in black paint. Um, while this action had an uh, immediate impact on the memorial in terms of its appearance, um, it made the names much more legible, it's obviously far removed from what Historic England would normally consider to be appropriate heritage practice. The resident was then asked by the vicar of the church if he could stop these works, citing the listing of the church and the requirement of consent to carry out these works. However, this incident sparked outrage within the local community and was reported in the local papers one using the headline of anger at war memorial red tape delay. The resident responsible for the work had lost a brother during the Second World War and his name was among those listed on the memorial. So to him this is an object not of heritage but a living memorial to his brother whose ability to act as such was severely compromised by the illegibility of the names and as a result picking out his brother's name in black paint is not seen as an inappropriate action as it's just furthering the, the role of the memorial. This desire to maintain the legibility of names um, is tied closely to the desire to add names to a memorial. So during the First World War centenary, there's been um, a lot of local history research around the names on memorials. And this has uncovered many missing names and subsequently calls to add these names to the memorials. Such calls have an added layer of significance if it's felt that the reason for omitting these people um, in the first instance was because of something that we would now consider inappropriate, for example, the person's gender um, or their religion, and has often led to ac accusations that these people were deliberately forgotten. One such forgotten casualty um, was that of Kitty Trevelyan, a VAD nurse from the Dartmoor Hamlet of Meavy. Kitty had died of pneumonia in February 1917, 
and is buried in the Pays de Calais, France, um, and she has a Commonwealth War Grove, so she is commemorated at an official level, um, but she was not listed on the local memorial. Kitty's cause was taken up by um, a campaign group who call themselves Wenches in Trenches, um, who describe her admission. Um, so they um, issued a statement saying, in her village there have been just three names on the tiny memorial for the past hundred years. No reason is given for the admission. We can only deduct she was left off because she was a woman. As a result of her campaign, Kitty's name was added to her local memorial in February 2017, on the centenary of her death, and you can see the addition um, below there. But whilst the promotion of women in the public space is obviously something that can only be encouraged, the way in which it was enacted on this memorial, which was a listed structure at the time when the works were carried out, um, was the subject of much criticism from conservation <coughs> groups. As you can see from the image, um, the name can perhaps be seen to be at odds with the existing uh, inscription, and its placement directly under the date of the unveiling, a cause of confusion. In addition, the group had no evidence in which to base the assumption that Kitty was missed off just because she was a woman. We know that there's no set process of memorialisation followed by communities as they sought to commemorate their war dead. And often names were submitted by family members and omissions could be a result of families actually not wishing that their loved ones to be seen in such a public way. But whatever the reason for this admission, I think the actions of Wenches and Trenches raises important questions about the role of memorials. Should they be viewed as historical records of the time of their construction? Or should they instead be responsive to the need to commemorate in the contemporary? For this community, the need to commemorate a woman on their local memorial was considered very important. Um, but from a cons conservation uh, perspective, this memorial has been unchanged for the last hundred years. But which one of those should, should have precedence? In my final example, I'm going to br briefly look um, at a memorial whose value as an eloquent witness allowed it to be protected through listing, um, despite having undergone significant transformations, which would normally prevent um, such a process being carried out. So this is Cal's War Memorial on the Isle of Wight. It was dedicated just after the war on the 13th of March. It was originally located at the junction of the High Street and Market Hill in Cal's. And as you can see from the picture on the left, sorry, it consists of a square column of dress dressed granite with um, a union flag draped over the top and bronze plaques attached to each side. However, the memorial suffered significant bomb damage during an air raid on the night of the 4th and 5th of May, of which the memorial's bronze plaques were lost. <coughs> the memorial was subsequently relocated to Northwood Park, where it was reinstated in its partly demolished form and rededicated on the 11th of November. The memorial now can be seen to commemorate not only those local servicemen who died during the First World War, but also the 63 men and one woman who died in the Second World War and its subsequent damage. Under normal circumstances, so under normal listing criteria, um, such a monument would not be eligible um, for listing because it has such significant damage, um, because the, the fabric of the monument has been so severely compromised. However, in an approach taken through the programme, which considered the biography of the um, object, um, which is now not just seen to represent the First World War, but the Second World War and the subsequent story of the memorial, allowed this monument to be listed in 2016. So this is a very different kind of value um, attributed than those attributed to memorials listed prior to the programme, but I think equally raises interesting questions about what this programme itself is trying to achieve um, and the, the value of, of listing when we move so far um, away from those criteria. So I just want to draw out um, some brief conclusions from those uh, three examples. Hopefully it's clear from the examples presented here that the values of memorials are ever-changing, um, that the special value placed on memorials that were constructed at the time of the conflict is because that they were constructed by the bereaved and that those who had direct autobiographical experience of the conflict. That the tensions exist between the values placed on memorial by a community, which often sees it as an active site of memory, one which needs to be flexible to changing attitudes towards the war dead, to be all-encompassing, um, and that of a, a memorial as an object of heritage and a tangible representation of a significant episode in British history, 
particularly when this value is enshrined by a national organisation such as Historic England through listing. Questions arise as the, the regarding the appropriateness of a national organisation imposing these values on an object that's often a core part of the community. But Historic England are currently working with the church in Shirley to conserve the memorial and strip back the paints, so stripping away part of the story of this gentleman who wanted to preserve the memory of his brother. We're also working um, through the War Memorials Trust to remove Kitty's name from the memorial and add it to a separate plaque. Likewise, the funding of major repair by government, so this £2 million that we're um, uh, allocating, <coughs> while it plays a vital role in ensuring that memorials are well maintained, it increases the expectation that the memorials should be cared for centrally. But this is seemingly at direct odds with the very thing that we've ascribed these monuments with significance, that they were erected and maintained only by the local community.